Okay, so about halfway through, I'll get the juice and uh, we'll see what happens. Oh, always man. wear your safety equipment, guys. This is what You're I always say. Real. You always hear me preaching that. Okay guys, John from John's Custom Saws, again, and we're going to do that guy right there. And that is for Mr. Volaton, Volaton, uh, I'm not sure, I can't pronounce his last name. Everybody screws my last name up too, which is weird because it's Custom Saws, but we're going to do that guy start to finish. I probably won't edit a lot out because, and I know I keep complaining about this and crying about it, but guys, I should have been a millionaire by now. I thought this thing would have blown up and I'd be filthy rich, YouTube star, but they won't even monetize your channel until you get 4,000 view hours. They call it watch hours, but whatever. So at the rate I'm going, that'll be 65 years, uh, literally 65 years. So this video is going to be really long. If you wanted to help me out, if you ever wanted to do something for me, ever, don't buy me a Christmas present. You know, nothing like that. Just watch this whole video. Even if you got to mute me, you just shut off the sound, but check it because YouTube like shuts your videos down. They know like they're like, Hey, nobody's watching this guy. So either way, we're going to do that thing. Start to finish. And you guys will be along for the ride. I'm probably not going to edit much out. That way it's a really long video. Takes me about three and a half hours to do one of these saws. So the video is probably going to be a little shorter than that. Um, you know, someone stops in or if I get a call or whatever, you know, I'm so important. But uh, I'd appreciate it if you guys watched it. That would really help me out. Get on the way to this, you know, fame and fortune because, man, I thought this would have went way faster than this. I thought, like, video, video, YouTube star, Lamborghini, see you later, little people. And it just hasn't worked like that. So help a guy out, please. Okay, well, here we go. One thing, I shut my heater off so we don't have that squealing in the background. Man, that drives me nuts. It doesn't drive me nuts actually when I'm here working, but when I notice it in a video that I record, worst thing ever. So we got this out. Let me should I check and see if you are, yeah, you could see that. Okay, so you're gonna see tear down everything. See how I get my, my numbers? All that good stuff. I will have to cut the camera and move it around a little bit because I have it sitting on the stand that I use. And so in here, we always got the owner's manual and I'll show you a little trick that I do. So there's his tools. Oh, it doesn't have a scrunch because I was actually, I'm gonna do something cool for his scrunch. But uh, one thing I do, I should have not put my glove on yet. So this is kind of something, I hope you guys can see. This tag on the front, that is the serial number that is stamped into the saw. So I take that thing off. I try not to get it dirty or nothing. And I take it on the front inside page of the owner's manual. I put that bad boy right there. And then I take a piece of clear tape that's way over here. I put a piece of tape over it. And as long as you have your owner's manual, because people actually do keep these things. There you go. So he's got a serial number for life. And then I'm going to powder coat his scratch, by the way. That's, that's what I'm doing with it, but that's why it's not in here. So I'll take that off. And then, Jesus, dirty already. But that's why I wear, I wear gloves. I'm not a, I'm not a sissy. Don't make fun of me. But uh, I do it because I don't want to get dirt all over their saw. So I end up, uh, in the end, I'll get a bigger bag because I got to put the put the max flow in there. And then if he wants his old the stock felling dogs and all that. But serial number in the owner's manual. The rest of the stuff in the box is basically the West Coast stuff. And we don't need that right now. But uh, here we go. We're ready for teardown. And I'll do the teardown and then I'll talk about what stuff that uh, you're gonna need 
Um, not that anybody's really going to do this. I think that like, most of the people, a lot of these port, how to port videos, I don't really get them because either you know how to do it or you don't, or if you don't know how to do it, there's a million videos out there. So this one's going to be a little different. This is just going to be like me talking, rambling on, and uh, hopefully you guys like it. So right away, I use power tools. If you have a problem with that, cry me a river because it's not realistic to take these things apart without power tools if you're trying to make a living. I'm, I'm very upfront, I'm straight up, I don't bullshit, but that's 100% the case. If you wanted to do this for a living, it, you, you can't do this, you can't take these things apart with a T. It's just not, real, not realistic. So, and I'm not endorsing Snap-on by any means, but one thing that is nice about the uh, Snap-on bit driver, I think they call it a bit driver, the four, little 14.4, is that this is this locks this is always locked and i'll show you on the recoil so if i want to bust this loose i'm not touching the trigger see that then if you can you go in so i'll have this set kind of light and then i can torque it in so you know what i mean it's always locked when you're not on the trigger and the rocker trigger is nice so i keep this set kind of low so if you see me like ramming a bolt in don't think that i'm stripping stuff out I just get that out of the way and uh, it's, it's just the way that this tool works. But uh, yeah, so basically, I mean, everybody's seen teardown. Um, I keep the, the bolts and stuff in, you know, a little, I got these little trays that are separated. I'm not gonna move the camera over there cause I wanna make sure I know it's in the right spot. I really don't like that these these little screws right here are retained. It kind of drives me nuts. I don't know why. Like when you try to put the cover back on, it, it just, uh, those little things, you gotta like make sure they're out. Kind of just something dumb, but I don't like it. But other than that, I mean, the 461's awesome. I'm not complaining about the 461, it's a great saw. I tell you what though, it, it's a great saw, but stock, it's not very impressive stock, honestly. It's uh, kind of a turd. I ran one stock for the first time a while back. I was like, wow, like that's the saw I've been telling everybody to get. Like, Jesus. Felt kind of felt kind of bad about it, honestly. Hoping that like getting my base up in there. So you take this filter base off, you want your choke down. Um, I'll probably take the limiter caps out right away. So yeah. I guess uh, I'll just have to fill in the time with talking. So now it feels awkward if there's a silence for like even a couple seconds. So I don't know any tricks that I just take, I basically take that thing out like that. Some of these parts, you got to use a little bit of force. I've never wrecked one doing that. Uh, I've never had really, you know, obviously every mechanics is, has stripped out bolts here and there. But so this guy right here, you can get, I like to get behind it because this fuel line, once you break that fuel line loose, this thing will come out really easily. So... Let's talk about how we remove the limiter caps. So these are, this This is a tool from steel, but these red limiter caps, they need to go because I do wanna add fuel, especially to the low end, which gives fuel through your whole cycle. So this is a reverse thread. So the reason for that is I'm gonna, I'll take this, this one out. Kinda of hard to do this on camera. This is gonna take way more than three and a half hours with this rate if I'm explaining everything. So. There's a little tab in there and you have to line the, the little tab up. My eyes are getting bad. I just noticed this the other day. I'm like, man, I can't see a damn thing ever. Oh, I had it. So once you do line the tab up, there it is. Okay. I just take it over to the bench, the bench grinder and hit it, but it's that little guy, right? there this little tab so that thing has to go i'm probably way too close but that guy has to go i'll show you what it looks like when it's when it's done i mean literally like nothing to take it off so it's smooth now you probably can't see it but anyway there's a little tab on there trust me and when you put this back in i line it up so that it's i'll show you when i take this out so the reason it's reverse thread is so you can tighten 
that set screw and then this the tool threads out otherwise you'd be you'd be loosening it and you'd have to take the whole set screw out so again reverse thread line up the tab with your horrible eyes because I'm getting old guys okay get this one Okay, so those are out. I'll tell you where I set mine. So I, I want to make sure that they're all the way shut, obviously, to set this. And uh, I'm going to set my low, which is the side closest to the cylinder, at one and a quarter. I know that seems like a lot to you guys, but trust me, that's where I want it. And then one. And an eighth. And this is going to be for start up and break in. I turn the idle in a little bit and I'll adjust it out after I get it going. But for the initial startup heat cycles and all that, I want the, uh, I want the thing really rich and I don't bump start them or nothing like that. I basically, I start it as, you know, put fuel in it and start it with the, the choke. Um, I know some guys are like, after they pour the saw or they start them up the first time, they, they, bump start them. I don't like doing that. I don't know why. It's just like, you shouldn't need to. It should start just fine. So yeah, how's your guys' day? This is kind of weird. I can't listen to music because you guys, you wouldn't be able to hear me. And I get a copyright strike and uh, that kind of sucks. I don't want to get a copyright strike. Oh, do you see? This is what I took the or used to take the spark plug off don't want to just pull on that damn thing with anything because you'll pull that the coil out of the middle so you guys can see what i'm doing i guess basically taking the muffler off the cover and Good, the gasket didn't stick to the muffler, so it actually just goes in the drawer. So the the stock air filter and the stock muffler cover, I do not send them back with the saws because I do not want them using it unless they have a different saw that they can put it on. Then, then I'm okay with it, but I don't want anybody using a stock air filter or the stock muffler cover on a ported saw, absolutely not. Um, another thing, it, it, milling. You don't want to mill with a ported saw. If, if, if someone asks for a, you know, me to build them an 088, ask what they're using it for, and they're like, oh, we're going to mill with it. Nope. Definitely don't want to do that. I take the, well, I would replace them anyway, but I take the felling dog off because it goes in my, my little chainsaw vise, and uh, I can't have the felling dog on there for that. These two just, I don't know why, it's just like a habit. I just, I put these back in. It's like one of these, like the only bolt you could possibly get mixed up is uh, even though I keep them in trays, that way I know those are, those go there and you know, that's it. I, I see a lot of people have a hell of a time getting those off. I, I don't know, I guess it's just like second nature to me. But I just take a screwdriver and pry it out, and then when I put it back on, I'll probably show you, but I, uh, I give it a little bit of a squeeze with the pliers, so then it, it tightens it back up a little bit. Not a lot, obviously, you don't want to bend it, but I run my degree wheel on a keyless chuck, and I use it on the clutch side, and then I use the, my hand to turn the flywheel side, so that's why I take the, the clutch drum off. The wrap handle, I just take that off just so it's not in the way. You wouldn't really need to, but uh, that's just the way I do it. I wonder how long my camera is going to record for. So this is where this uh, this bit driver is really nice to, to break bolts loose. And I tell you what, I've busted some crazy bolts loose and I've never had an issue. So I put this on high idle, oh, and then I put that the, the plug in right there. Didn't have that one busted loose yet. Make sure I got them all out because the talking on camera is kind of weird. But uh, so yeah, I I run this boot out. Some people disconnected, 
disconnect it at the cylinder and then they just, you know what I mean, they leave it hanging in there. But, okay, we got the cylinder off. And all these saws are test ran at the factory, so if you're seeing your carbon on it and stuff and you're like, what the hell is going on there? They're all like that. It's just uh, how they come. Oh, okay, so the rings. Don't ever take rings off with the pliers. Nothing like that. This, this always rips my gloves too. But I just take my, kind of my fingers and just squeeze them out a little bit and uh, they come right off. And then I'm gonna save at least two of these bolts, but I put the, the rings and the circlip and all that stuff. Get the base gasket off of this. And then I want everything stripped off of the cylinder because we gotta put it on the lathe and port it, obviously. Make sure this is all the way loose. Okay. There's always grease on these from factory. When you do, I don't know why I do that, but uh, these, I don't reuse spark plugs. Garbage. I put a new spark plug in every single time because that crush washer is a one-time use deal. Do not ever reuse a spark plug. They will leak. Not every time, but trust me, they do leak. I've seen them a lot. I even had a video up that got pulled down for some reason. It must have been really controversial of the uh, a spark plug that I took out and uh, I put it back in. It was a new one. I put it back in and I air tested it, pressure tested it, and it failed. So that should show you right there. These little circ clips. I don't have a really good trick for these. I just be, basically use a crooked pick and I put my finger down there so it doesn't fly away. And uh, there we go. It's out. So to get the wrist pin out, because I am machining this piston and I do some other stuff to it, I just take this screwdriver I know fits in there really well, but you don't ever want to put a lot of force on your, your connecting rod. So basically you can push it out, but don't start pounding on it. If that thing doesn't want to come out, don't, you know, don't take a hammer and start pounding on the damn connecting rod. It's kind of a no brainer for most people, but I mean, you never know. Some people aren't, they don't think of stuff like that. So there we go, we got that stripped down. It's gotta go into the chainsaw vise, but we'll talk about the piston first. So I do clean up all the little casting defects. I clean out the windows a little bit. And then obviously, like I said, I'm gonna dome it. And that, I won't be able to show you guys how I do it because it was passed down to me from a legit legend. And uh, I can't be showing you know something that somebody showed me like that. And I think it's, I'm probably, the, might be the only guy that I know of that does it, that I'm sure there's, Somewhere, somebody somewhere does it, but um, he passed it down to me and then he doesn't build saws anymore really. So uh, it might be the only guy. Um, but anyway, I'll show you the piston after it's done, but I can't show you how I do it. So I'm just gonna clean this up a little bit. Just taking this casting, little casting defects off. Nothing, nothing major, you wouldn't have to do this. Okay, and then I use a I use a Fordham grinder that's on a foot pedal. I'll show you all that after I I cut camera and set the chainsaw up on the vise. I'll kind of walk you around here and show you what I'm all using and what what I need. So I just take the casting defects out of the windows and clean them up a little bit. You don't need to make them real big. Uh, this 461 is kind of a weird saw. It's it's got a different set of transfers on it, and it, and it's still got piston windows, so they're it's kind of overkill anyway. But I still do just clean them up just for peace of mind. I'm not really taking material out. Just taking out the casting defects. And if this was a saw that was built really rowdy and it was like a 66 or a 46, something like that, I would open them up a little bit. The 66, they're actually, they're pretty good size. The 44 and 46, I like to open them up. But again, this is not, I'm not opening these up, I'm just cleaning them up. So 
So I'm barely pressing. If you guys are thinking like, holy shit, he's taking a lot of stuff. I'm not, not, trust me. And then uh, you can grind out all the the stamps and numbers and all that in there if you want, just to shave a little extra weight. Have the piston cleaned up a little bit. And I will, I have a, like a little sanding bit that I'll come in here and I'll clean that up a little bit, but I gotta go dome this. So you guys can't watch that, but I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. And uh, the rest, you guys can pretty much watch. So. Okay guys, so I have, my cylinder is set up here. I found my zero with my dial indicator. Everything's in round, uh, good to go. Piston is domed, so that is done. And what I'm gonna do now is I have the cylinder on here and I'm going to deck it. They call it decking in the biz because it's cool to say decking, I guess. But uh, I use the tailstock to lock it, lock the cylinder onto just a, a mandrel, steel mandrel. And um, this just works really good. It's kind of like the old fashioned, you know, the, the way to do it. And uh, you have different mandrels for different size bores. And yeah, everything is all set up. I had the gearbox freed up, so I'm gonna lock it in now. And I'll probably have to set this thing down. But I know that when I'm right there, oh, you can't see the dial indicator, so I'll back it up again. On zero, right? Because I'm on the inside of the cylinder, I'm not hitting anything right now, but this is so hard to do this one. I usually use two hands, but right. Right there is zero. So now I know that my cutter is right on the base of the cylinder. If I moved it out like this, it would scratch a little line right in the base. So there we go, we're zeroed out. And then I start on the inside. I don't I don't know if it really matters, um, but you can go inside out, outside in, doesn't matter. As long as you're paying t attention to your measurement there. So uh, I noticed this glass is cracked on my dial indicator, but uh, it's still good to go. It's just, it's not, nothing wrong with it. I just, I'm going to get a new one now or new glass, but so, all right, I'll, this, this thing, the camera might move around and stuff when I do this. So if it does, I'll just cut this out, but I'm going to start it up and make a few passes and then I'll meet you back at the table. And I'm, I take off about 10 thou at a time, just the way I do it. probably moving like crazy, huh? My lathe is on a wood floor and uh, I need to, hold on a sec. Wasn't that awesome, but, but anyway, here's the piston is done. Uh, I always take a paper towel. So these saws are all run at the factory. Uh, they run them on the assembly line. This one does look like it was ran just a bit more than than normal than you normally see. But I always get this crap out of here. There's, this one's got a ton of it in there, but you can see just might as well clean that out. Put some fresh two-stroke oil in there and. The paper towel stuff, I'll clean that out with a carb cleaner. It's not going to hurt it. I like to get the, the crankcase nice and clean. Low pressure air, you don't want to, you know, blast a ton of air in there. Then I'll put a little bit of fresh two-stroke in there. Thing nice and clean now. Real heavy on it, and it can uh, it's like six or so drops. Then I can clean it out at the end if I want to. There we go, nice and smooth. So I'm gonna put this in. This is already cleaned up, but hit it again. Carb cleaner is gonna be a handy little deal to have and a little squirt bottle of two stroke oil. Puts them on the wrist pin. That was a bit much, but 
All right, so there is a trick or a tool that I have, I should say, for putting in the circlip for the wrist pin. I call them circlips, but some people use like a, a couple picks. There's all kinds of methods. Uh, the, what I use is the specialty tool and just works really good. Here's that same screwdriver, just kind of, I don't know, this thing just kind of works good for, for these. It's like the right size. So, these little clips. I never learned the like the pick method. Like some people use a two picks or something to put them in. I give them a little spread just to get them tight. This is a tool from steel. Oh, well, you guys can see this. So the way this works, again, always clean everything up. This thing's magnetic too, so. Okay, so you have the end there. It's got a a slot on it. I've got a hole in my glove already. I'm just going to take the damn thing off. Okay. So I'll set that little clip on there like that. And then that presses into this, which has the opening. Okay, so now that little clip is in here. And then you take this tool and it presses again hold um the weight the opposite way and it is in that's how that works uh i really like that tool and then i use something that a lot of these other guys probably never heard of in their life it's a hand file how crazy is that I actually spend quite a bit of time chamfering edges. I, just, I think it's really important. And I won't even worry about jinxing myself. Like I have not caught a ring in like probably six, seven years. Like I, I caught two rings in a row on these. I mean, back then I was kind of a different story than what I'm doing now, but I had two saws in a row that caught a ring. One was just for a buddy. One was for my father-in-law. I wasn't really charging people at that point, but uh, after that, I was like, man, this ain't ever happening again. And it hasn't since then, but I caught it on the exhaust port, but I'll chamfer all the edges once I'm done with this thing. But now we're just gonna check squish. Okay, so just put two bolts in. I use the base gasket, I don't use gasket maker. That's just me. I know a lot of people use the gasket maker and I can totally see why they do. And I can totally see why the guys that don't use it don't. That it's, uh, I honestly say that each way works just fine. It just, I like to stay consistent. You know, I like to I like to see that other other guys too. Is like just stay consistent with what you're doing. Wait for this air compressor to stop. But what I have noticed is it kind of seems like oh my god, shut up. There it goes. Jeez. It kind of seems like uh, and this isn't talking trash on anybody. This is just kind of the way that I've I've noticed it is. The guys that are always trying different stuff, like always trying different stuff, different stuff, different stuff, this week, next week, you know, and I'm not talking like personal saws, like my nitrous saw and all that, that's different, but on customer builds, that tells me that they aren't happy with their build. Uh, this is a build that was passed on to me and I have stuck with it ever since. And it's, it's an amazing build. I do the same thing. Uh, I have two different versions of it and it's basically... You know, I'm so confident in this build. Everybody that gets it loves it. They, uh, you know, they couldn't be happier with it. And it's across the board. You know, like uh, the 500 i is kind of a build that I developed, but pretty much all these other saws, I, I do the domed machine piston, uh, you know, and then ported decked machined. Uh, I, I think I do a pretty damn good job when it comes to the, the cylinder work, the porting and polishing and all that stuff, chamfering and all that. And uh, I think that... You know, everybody knows the numbers to get. I do this 
I run that squish a whole bunch of times. Like I want to make sure I'm, I know where I'm at with my number and I check it on, on all sides basically. So everybody's seen how we check squish, but like I said, we need to get them view hours. So we're going to make this long. Okay. No, yeah, nothing special here. Everybody's seen this. Check it with solder. So I was pretty close. I'm at 2-2. Two, two. I'm going to take 2 thou off. I want to be at 20 on my squish. And then I'll show you how to set up the degree wheel. I don't set up the, the degree wheel until I get all the machining done. That's just how I do it. Uh, again, there's other ways that work. You know, I just think why, why mess with it until you have, you know that you're not changing your port height anymore. Because when you deck your cylinder, it drops, you know, it drops your ports. Uh, so... I just wait until I have all the machining done. Okay, guys, we're going to do a real dumbed down version of this. I have this cutaway. Yes, I realized somebody beat me to the punch. The guy did a really good job, too. Uh, but I didn't know that when I made this. Kind of found out after. But anyway, um, this is a 461. This is a 461. Well, it's half of one. So this will be kind of easy to explain. And I'll explain how we get the timing. Real simple. And the reason we're moving the ports. So... I'm going to use easy numbers. Uh, so this, this isn't the actual numbers of the saw, but I'm just going to use it as an example. So it's really easy to understand. Okay. So at bottom dead center, the piston is going to go up once the, I wonder if a flashlight would work really good for this. I'm going to grab one quick. Sorry guys. This could make it a little rough and I took the glove off. So, okay. So right when that starts to crack right there, Right at the, the floor of the intake, as soon as that, that skirt, the bottom of the piston is above that floor, it is going to start taking in the fuel air mixture, okay? So it's going to take it in from there to there. So you get what I'm saying? So it, it it's always measured on the degree wheel also before top dead center and obviously you're spinning the crank the way that the the saw runs you wouldn't spin it this way and you wouldn't measure so you're measuring your intake timing before top dead center you wouldn't measure it after top dead center you're going to get a different number so before top dead center boom right when it clears that is your intake number and we're going to say that's 70 degrees so we're at bottom dead center and boom it's actually right here so that's 70 degrees see what i'm saying we're at bottom dead center that's my little pointer up there Going, 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 and whoop. So we're saying it's right there, 70 degrees. Now if we look down here, you can see, oh, can you see? Right there, so 70 degrees, pretending it's right there. So we write that, rewrite that number down, so that's this. Now, let's get the exhaust, so that is measured after top dead center. So let's get this to top dead center. Okay, now it's gonna come down. Everybody's seen the flashlight deal. Shine a flashlight through there, you get your ray of light, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's just say that that is 105. So after top dead center. So once you get to 90, sorry for shaking, but I need to pan back and forth, otherwise you guys can't see. So 90, we don't go back to 80, we go to 100. You keep going, okay? So we're at 90, 100, and five. Okay, so on this one, top to the center, 90, 100, and 5. So we're just going to say it's right there. We got that number written down, 105. Now, the uppers are these two ports right here on this saw. They're, you know, they're different on every other saw. But So we're going to go until they crack open. So we're at 105. I'm going to keep going, and we're just going to say that these opened at 130, which is right here. Okay, does that make sense? 105, so what? 100, 10, 20, 30. Yep, I'm sorry, I'm double checking myself here. 130 be right there, yep, because 45 is 135. So now we're on this one, we are right here. Okay, so that's 130 after top dead center. Now your blowdown is really simply this number minus this number. So it's your uppers minus your exhaust, 
which is 25. Pretty simple, right? 130 minus 105, 25, you, you, you with me? Now, when we're changing port timing, this is the reason. You always hear, you take the intake down, the floor of the intake down, and you raise your exhaust, all that good stuff, right? Okay, so why do they do that, or why do we do that? Now, think of this as a one-way valve, and for the smart asses that want to comment, I understand. I'm just going to say for this demonstration, let's think of it as a one-way valve, okay? So now, the way it is stock, let's, let's say that this cylinder is ported, and the intake is already lower, the exhaust is already higher, and all that, okay? So let's say you're, and I'm going to be drastic here, let's say your intake was opening right there. That was the stock cylinder. And it was, it would be open from there to there. Okay, that makes sense? Because it, we lowered it. This is the cylinder that we're looking at is ported. So a stock would have been from there to there. Now it's open because this is the ported cylinder. It's open from there to there. That's a much greater distance than from there to there. I keep rolling past it. So from there to there, now it's open from there to there. And that whole time that it's open, it's taking in the fuel air mixture. Okay, so now throughout the 360 degrees, you're adding time, it's called duration, you're adding time, adding degrees of rotation that, that it, this port is open and it's taking in fuel air mixture, so it's taking in more, right? So now we've taking we're taking in more fuel what are we going to do with it now the way this cycle works is suck squeeze bang blow so we'll call that suck that's the intake it draws in the fuel air mixture now it's once the top of the piston is past the exhaust everything up here is sealed off it doesn't know where to go so this is the compression so squeeze and then you'll have your your spark which is actually like right here so it sparks boom bang and then once the top of the piston clears the roof of the exhaust, blow. Okay? And then once these the uppers crack open, that's going to start taking in the charge from down here into your uh, combustion chamber. Okay? Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Make sense? Okay? So now with the exhaust, same thing. After top dead center. We always measure intake before top dead center. Exhaust and uppers after top dead center because you'll get a different number if you measure them before. So now when this is open, so we're pretending this is a ported cylinder, and this is why we raised the exhaust. So before it was open from here to here, okay? Now we raised it, now it's open from here, no, from here, god damn it. I should take the coil off of it, that's, that's what's, it's a magnet. So it's open from here to here, much greater distance more degrees of rotation, longer period, whatever you want to call it, than from there to there. And blowdown is quite simply, once the exhaust cracks open and your exhaust is going out, it's going to take in the charge quicker than if it was if it was still down here. Because uh, when, you, when you raise your exhaust, let's use this as, as an example on the degree wheel. So after top dead center is where we're going to get our exhaust. So we're at 105. Okay, now we've we've raised it. This would be the piston going up. We're going backwards now. So we've raised it to 100. So we went from 105 to 100. If we don't change the uppers to match it, we would be at 105 and 130. Oops, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, we'd be at 100 and 130, so our blowdown would be 30. We're getting too wide. You see what I'm saying? So if we change our exhaust but not our uppers, we don't go up. So here, we went up on the exhaust, up on the uppers, kept our blowdown the same. That's why when you change your exhaust height, you have to keep that in mind. Now, intake, we're going down, so say we were at 70, we're going to go to 80. Not saying that these are numbers you use. I'm just saying that that is how you get the numbers. That's what they're for in a nutshell. There's a million videos. Uh, this is going to be more of a video on me actually porting and just rambling. Uh, I'm not the guy that explains stuff real technical. I just go, look at this wheelie, wingy, dingy thingy. We're going to make this son of a bitch a lot better. Cool?
Cool. That's all I, that's what I do. I just make it better. All right, guys, let's get to grinding. So this is how I, I mark my, I get my markings. I'm not going to go through what numbers I'm using and how I got them. There's again, a million videos, but I use, I keep a, a piston and ring from every bore size and you just set your ring in there somewhat level and you, as long as you're using the right end of the piston, cause some of them are not even, but if you use the top and you push it down, it's gonna be perfectly level and even, and then you can put it at the height you want, make your measurement, draw a line. I just use a marker, nothing special there. Lots of stuff works to write on them, but that's how I get my measurements. So now I have the measurements I want and I'm gonna start grinding on it. I'm gonna start with this real aggressive bit. Um, I did the, the lower transfers, but to do this, you have to also do work to the crankcase. So I wouldn't recommend that, especially for a, you know, a guy just starting out to do this. And I do what they call like a lunged intake, so, or tonsil, and I have the mark drawn in there where I want it. And the rest of it is just kind of shaping it how I want it. So let's get to it, finally. I stand when I work, I always stand. I don't know why I just never sit down. Don't ever use one of these bits on a Husky. That's no knock against Husky. Their cylinder lining is garbage. It will flake off so bad. On the steels, the cylinder lining is, is so tough, it's crazy. And that's why I do steel and not husky. It's literally for that reason. I'm so sick of replacing cylinders on my dime. Okay, now, some of this I won't be able to, because I get kind of rattly, like at first when I was rattling around a little bit, because I'm trying to show you guys what I'm doing, but I need to hold this like I need to hold this. And as long if you rattle around it, you know, when you're just doing rough cutting and you're not chipping the cylinder lining, it's, it's I mean, it's not a good thing, but it's not going to hurt anything. You definitely don't want to hit your cylinder wall with, with one of these bits on accident. You will be, it'll take a chunk out of it. Okay, I'm pretty close to where I want, I want my corner. And I have the arc that I want. And like, this, this is gonna be real rough, trust me. When this thing's done, it'll look like a million bucks. You guys won't believe it. For those of you that have seen my work already, uh, you know what it you know what it looks like when it's done. So it doesn't it's not always pretty. It, it takes a little bit to get there. So now I'm just gonna take all the meat out of the the middle where I got my four corners. I don't make the outside of the exhaust very much larger. In fact, here's a trick. So you can take your heat shield. You can put this bad boy on there. Use the two short bolts if you 
just to be safe so you're not poking through anything. And uh, run these in, and you don't need to go any bigger than this. You really don't. They have a plenty uh, big enough area for the exhaust. The key is the timing. They have plenty of upflow, so we get it timed where we want it. And so now that you got that on there, it's like a template. It's kind of a easy way to make sure that you stay within those lines. And you can see like there's a little bit here that can come out and here. And this from factory was actually, this was sticking up above it. So we'll take that down, make it all nice and smooth. You don't want any ledges. Okay, now let's take every, all the meat out. I hit it from different angles too. Keeps it pretty flat. I heard someone say like, if you're going back and forth, that's a sign of like, a you know, being a rookie at this. I would highly disagree. Um, I would challenge just about anybody to, uh, whose ports look nicer when I'm done. Uh, so I don't, I don't get why people say shit like that. It's because they don't do it. So then they say, oh, only the good people don't, don't do it like that. It makes no sense. Whatever works for you works. If someone does a good job, they do a good job. It's that simple. People are goofy. I don't like putting a lot of pressure and sweeping until I get down to the double cut. And I'm doing more fine tuning. This thing takes stuff off so fast, you don't want to sit in one spot. Like that would take a, quite a bit longer without the aggressive dip. Once you get better at this, you'll notice that, like at first, you'll want it. You'll have this all really big out here, the the outside of the exhaust, and then it like humps down and it goes in small. When you get real good at this, uh, you'll have everything from here to the back even. That's how you can tell if someone knows what they're doing with this. It'll be one even, you know, from here to the the cylinder wall even. No humps, no area where they didn't get the stuff out. So that's why there's a lot coming out right here, even though I'm not taking. I'm not opening the ports very much larger, not really, uh, on the cylinder wall a little bit, but then I'm making this even. This thing is going to be like perfect when I'm done. It's like perfect angles, perfect, you know, no humps, no, no valleys, nothing.
All right, there we go. So we got the uppers shaped up right where I want them. Still kept that that factory like slant to it and just moved them. So that's that is basically a JCS 461 right there. And a uh, couple little tricks up my sleeve, but nothing real crazy. Uh, just try to do a good job. I will polish up the the exhaust and give everything a nice finish and then finish decking it and uh, probably show you guys what it looks like after that and then throw this baby back together and I got two more to do yet today so I gotta get them done boys all right well they're roughed out pretty well now the part I can't let anybody see top secret how I get them looking damn nice sorry guys see you back in a few Put my initials in it though, so then you know it's the same cylinder. Let me set the camera up. So, I always put my initials this way on these, right on the, right up here. Good. Bella, what you barking at? Bella. Okay. Then I'll uh, hold on. Bella, what are you barking at? Quiet. All right. Then I'll do. I do uh, the month and year. Then H is for dome piston. Makes a lot of sense, right? There we go. Official. All right, there it is, closer up. I make sure I put it on there pretty nice, not just chicken scratch. So H means dome piston, 1121, pretty obvious. JA, who's that guy? No idea. So I don't know how well this is going to show up. It looks like it's, you can see it pretty good. So you see how I have that black line drawn there? I wonder if it's better with, no, it's better with the flashlight. Now you can see that those uppers are slanted in towards each other. Some are slanted towards, both towards the intake, both towards the exhaust. It's kind of, it kind of varies, but I like to keep the, the factory slant. So I'm I'm moving I'm moving these uppers uh, almost five degrees, like four degrees. 
Okay, so I'm just going to keep that that slant and then I'm going to move them four degrees and I'm not really widening them or anything like that, just changing the height and that's going to put me right where I want to be. Um, I don't I don't vary my builds. They are, they are all the same. The 100% dead same. And the only options are basically bolt-on stuff. You know, different muffler options and felling dogs, wrap handles, you know, filter upgrades, all that stuff. So every build that I put out is is the same build because I like it, I'm happy with it, I'm confident in it, and they don't change. So I'm just telling you how I do it is all. I'm not saying it's the best way. I'm not saying it's the only way. I'll say that time and time again. There's lots of guys who do crazy good builds. I'm just, you know, somewhere in the middle, and I'm happy with what I got, so um, that's just how I do it. But I'm going to change the heights, keep the angles, and I should be right where I want to be, and then I can clean this thing up and on to the next one. Uh, well, i got to put it back together, and then on to the next one, so we're getting there, guys. Hang in there. Okay, so to do the uppers, you pretty much have to have one of these. They're pretty expensive. It's like 500 bucks. It's a, basically a, the same style handpiece grinder, but it's a 90 degree angle. And I use like the, I use pretty expensive bits for, for this part of it because you don't want to catch an edge. You want to have a good bit. You don't want to start rattling around. But I got, I don't know if you can see it, but I got that side done, shaped where I want it. And I'm working on this side, and I figured I'd show you. Um, some people grab this thing like a, you know, with all they got. I, I'm kind of light with it. I just keep good speed and real, you know, basically methodical. You know, you don't want to be just kind of running around in there. You want to get to it, get it done, and get out of there. I keep good speed with it. And I just bring it right across the floor, which would be the, the top. Pretty good. A piece of lining there that I had to get through. Okay, I'll bring you guys down here and show you what it looks like. Okay, so I hit it. A little bit with my uh, homemade bits we'll call them and uh, I'm getting my shape that I want the intake I wouldn't want any smoother than that I like it a little bit rough like that uh, for keeping the fuel suspended and there is some truth to that and then here's the exhaust port from the inside it's key to get that thing looking really even no sharp edges and then now I'm going to do my uppers because that's where I'm going to end up on the exhaust I'm right where I want to be I just put it on the saw and measured it and uh, the lowers looking good and then I always leave like two thousandths of material to come off of the base of the cylinder that way when I do the lowers or anything else and do the chamfering I can hit it on the lathe one more time I'll show you what that looks like. It just puts a really clean finish on it instead of, you know, putting your, getting right where you want to be and then doing this work. And then if you, you know, have little defects in here, um, that's just how I do it. But yeah, there's the intake, that tonsilled intake, longed, whatever you want to call it. Looking good. And then I just got to do the, the final pass and that uh, is going to be what I consider polishing it, even though I, I don't use metal polish. Uh, but I'll get it looking like a million bucks uh, without metal polish. So 
it's just one of them, one of those things I try to find better ways to do stuff. And when I do, and it works, you just, you just can't give that stuff away. Uh, is it kind of sucks to be like that, but there, you know, in this business, there's only a few things that set guys apart. And if you got an edge on others, you know, my good close friends that do saws, obviously I share with them, they share with me, but I can't just throw it on YouTube, but let me touch up the uppers, measure them out. I'll use the same method, put the ring in there, use the piston, you know, put it down, get my measurements, mark them, and then, so uh, let me get the ring in there, and then I'll show you that the there's uh, they're staggered, and there's also a, a slant to them. So I'll, I'll kind of explain that a little bit, but it's easier to explain once I have a, a sight line in there so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so here it is, finished product. That's the exhaust. Looking damn good. Turn the flash on here. So the exhaust is a mirror finish. Totally smooth. Intake, I I rough it up a little bit. Kind of I kind of compared to like a cat's tongue, I guess. Um like a sandpapery finish. And lowers Uppers, if this thing would focus. Squish. Yeah, looks good, huh? I like it. Okay, so that's that. Then I did, I shaved the tooth owl off at the end. So piston's done. I do, this is something. So I do cut pieces of, this is just like a HVAC, like heat tape basically, and I cut a couple pieces there like they used to have in the, the old 400 series saws. They don't do it on the 461, but the less heat on the crankcase the better. And then I, I cut a piece for here too. So I try to make it look professional and like it was there, like it was meant to be there. And uh, I plug the decomps. I do not like decompressions. They leak, every one of them. Use a new spark plug. Never ever re reuse a spark plug. And also the decomp, if you would ever take this out, technically you should uh, you should replace it or throw a little bit of, you know, Durco HT on it. And now I get to do the muffler. So on these, I remove a bunch of this baffle so it's so it's below the exhaust port, and uh, get the damn bolt stuck in there. I keep the bolts in there, and I cut a little tab off of here, and pound this flat for the bark box. Then I add a third muffler port. So I'll I'll show you that when I'm when I'm in the middle of it, kind of how I do that. So let's get this done. Button this thing up. Okay, so I'm sure we are probably aware of this, but. Uh, you don't want to take all that time to do that work on the exhaust port and then block it off with a bunch of metal from the muffler or your heat shield or gasket. Um, the heat shield was on it when I did the exhaust port, but I'm just double checking it anyway. And then also you have to account, uh, especially the muffler, that when this thing is on here, I'll, let me just take this off for demonstration. So when you got your muffler on there, this thing can move a bit and you want to account for, you know, as, as much as it could move, even if you are tightening it down and it's squared and it's, it's perfectly centered and you have nothing, no meat sticking over. The problem is, is if that ever gets moved, well, then you're down here and you're blocking it off. So, uh, this is always going to be your choke point, the, the back of the muffler here. So I'm gonna open that up a little bit, and then we're gonna pretty much we're ready to slap it together. So that is the I removed that much of the baffle. I just take that thing down past the the floor of the exhaust, and I add the West Coast Universal muffler port. So that baby's on there, and that'll that'll work good. And then now you can see with so we got the bark box, that opening, the stock port. 
which is, I mean, is not very big, but it's amazing that that's all it's got stock. And then the West Coast port, which I open up all the way. So you can run the spark screens and it is not going to hurt anything. You're going to still have adequate flow, 100%. And then you're legal. So why, why not? You know, I run them on personal saws even. Why not? If you're that wide open, good to go. So let me clean that up and then finally can throw this thing back together. Uh, if you can't, couldn't tell from before, I'm in a different change of clothes because this is day two. I had a problem with the lathe. Um, it started making really crazy noises, so it's always something around here. That lathe has been super good to me, though, so I'm not complaining. Um, it was a, it was a quick fix, too, so, well, not quick, like three hours, but it didn't cost anything, basically. Let's put it that way. So not a quick fix, but not an expensive one. I'll take that any day of the week. All right, so... I am going to take this part out of the baffle so it has a, a clear path out the exhaust port, out the cylinder, and then right here, see that? So what I do is I like to pound this tab that way. So for the bark box, let me grab one clear. And if you guys are haters on the bark box, I don't know, I don't even want to hear it. I mean, give me a break, guys. Um, so the way it sits on here, it, if that tab was up like that, it wouldn't sit flat. This is the only muffler that you have to do this to. All the rest, it they bolt right up, and you got to get that flat. So some people pound that tab this way, and pound it down. I like to pound it that way, but you got to cut this little corner off right here, so it sits in this, in this. It divot so all you and then you shorten the spark screen up just a touch then she sits flat still use the the gasket uh, I am gonna add a third muffler port as well that's a West Coast product also and the West Coast dogs max flow filter I'll show you how I oil the filter I guess if, I probably already have it oiled actually but I usually do like 20 at a time if I if I can but uh, yeah, so this will be a triple port muffler wide open. Use all the spark screens. It's going to have plenty enough flow. So keep them in. Stay legal. All right, let's grab a power port and mark that thing up. Okay, so this is a, comes with the spark screen and everything. You can weld them on, you can use nut rivets, you can do all kinds of stuff. Regular standard rivets don't work very well. So, just from doing enough of these, I know that I have to, so these tabs are nice and easy to bend. So you gotta bend them both down, this top one, or what, if you wanna call it the top, I guess, quite a bit, and the bottom one, not so much. It's going to sit right there. And I know that if I have the this part below the, the top hole lined up with this, then it'll fit. Otherwise, you can get too low and it won't, it won't fit on the case. But right here is a perfect spot. I put a ton of them on right here. So for that, Mark the holes. You can see what I'm doing. And mark the inside. Perfect. So I'm going to do nut rivets. I like that, that it's, you can remove it, uh, clean the spark screen, and all that fun stuff. Okay, drill these out. Camera's gonna die. Um, 
let me plug that in, get the drill bit, the nut rivets, all that stuff. Well, apparently, doing these long videos, I ran out of storage on my phone, so that's kind of crazy. I thought there was like a cloud that did that, but anyway, start where I left off. So again, I can tighten these down with the with the bit driver. I get them pretty tight, and then for anything that is critical like this, I get with the the T handle just for peace of mind. Get a spark plug in there right away. Again, new spark plug every single time. Don't want to over tighten those. Well, yeah, I guess I gotta talk, do something while I'm doing this. Um, any tricks to this I can think of? Uh, just putting everything together, kind of just a, no particular order that you need to do it. This is just how I'm used to doing it. With the carbon now, we already removed the limiter caps. Um, just make sure that the impulse line and the fuel line both get in there. And I put it, I leave the choke on when I do the carb. That way nothing can fall in it. Like if you miss putting on one of the, the nuts that hold the, the, the intake baffle on and all that. Then this throttle cable, some people take this black handle strap off. I don't. I just feed this through here. Or I think I do. There we go. Cause this, this uh, throttle linkage right here, just it'll push right down in the handle there. Just like that. And then this piece got messed up somehow. Usually it never happens. That's kind of weird. I've never had that piece come off like that. Also, I do put this this piece right here, this uh, rubber piece that keeps the debris out of your filter base or filter box, carb box. Jesus. Okay, so that then you know it's in the right spot. Like right there, it's off a little bit. Otherwise, when you have the air filter base on and everything, you can't see what you're doing. So yeah, everything is lined up. That's good to go. Again, I leave the choke on. So carbs all in there like it's supposed to be. Your filter base. That I believe has to go on with the choke on. And these you don't need to over tighten. These were what I was talking about, so you don't, uh, if you have it on choke and then you would drop something down there, you're not going all the way down into your, you know, tearing it back apart again to get it out of your crankcase.
check your linkages and everything and switches, make sure they work. Put this awesome muffler on that we did. Make sure that if there is any metal shavings in it, we get them out. I'm just using a magnet to everybody's got their own different ways of doing this so the gasket I see when people work on their own saws I see this get mixed up a lot the gasket goes between the heat shield and the muffler and the heat shield goes that way I promise no Loctite don't need it So when you put your muffler on, before you tighten these two bolts, put put the bottom two in so, so it stays where you want it. And then when you crank these down, you know that these bolts are gonna are gonna go in where they need to. Just a little kind of a little trick that you can do. So I put these two bottom bolts in before I crank these down. Keeps everything where it's supposed to be. Make sure these are tight. I'll hit these with the T-handle too as well. Don't need Loctite, nothing like that. And then that way when you put the bark box on or your muffler cover, you know that the bottom bolts are right where they need to be. Oh. Almost forgot. You guys gotta, you guys gotta remind me when I forget something. Jesus, what are you doing? Sleeping? So now we know these bolts will, will line up right where they need to go. I'd find it. So I put the I put the muffler on before I put the top cover on, just because you can see what you're doing better. Not that there'd be anything messed up, but just easy to see. This is what I was talking about before. This kind of a, I don't really like how they have this design. Maybe I'm the only one that struggles with it. There we go. But yeah, if you have these like pushed in a little bit, you can't get the, you can't get the top cover down and it's just a mess. Some people leave this out. I put it back in. They can, you know, they don't want it in there. They can get rid of it with the max flow cover. And you know, I don't know if it's really necessary, but I like to have it on. Filter is already oiled. I do a bunch of them at a time. It's just it saves me time to just do it a whole bunch. These max flow covers. Okay, here's another trick of mine. This, 
What? You don't think so? Oh, man, my camera went crooked. That sucks. Here, let's straighten you back out. Okay, this little tab right here. Right here. Cut that off. It'll make your life way easier. And what's weird is it's al it's already got like a little... See this little notch right here? Or the... I don't know. Anyway, it's like it's got a little notch for you to cut it out. But I get rid of this damn thing. All the way up to the top. It just, for some reason, that thing is always in the way. When you're trying to tighten that cover down and believe it or not that little piece will make it a lot harder to get your cover tightened down because it like it wants to hit your choke or your selector switch i should say these max flows are kind of a pain in the ass the first couple times you put them on there jesus so even worse if you if you don't trim that piece and then I also my marker where the carb adjustment is if you have this filter cover all the way pushed all the way down or tightened down you can't get to these these screws so I cut this little area out just like that obviously that's a rough Rough drawing, but mark it, know where it is. Man, this camera keeps falling. Sorry, guys. But now I got it marked out. Cut that off. Make sure my filter is all the way down. These The back spools are just kind of, a, kind of tough at first. Trim this up a little better. I'm trying to rush through it since I'm on video. I don't want to do that. That is one thing that I don't. People that have on business with me know that I'm usually behind on deadlines but I don't rush it for a reason I want everything that goes out these doors to be 100% top quality that's no joke I just kind of score a little line and then it breaks right off. Cut it the rest of the way. Okay, looks pretty good. I just take sandpaper. That all drives me nuts to have the little little strings hanging off of it. Then you can even take a lighter, melt them off.
Perfect. So now when I put this on, these max flows are just kind of a pain at first. Then they get a little worn in, the filter does, and then it, it goes on pretty good. So now we can get to our set screws. Plenty of room. Also, these max flow covers, if you get anything on them, wipe it off right away because for some reason these they hold the oil and stuff. Another reason for the gloves. Um, they just it doesn't come off very well. Alright, wrap handle time. Longer screws go in the in the side on the three-quarter wrap handles. My battery's getting dead on this thing. Gotta get a new one. But yeah, don't ever put the long bolts or screws in the, the bottom by the fuel tank. That won't be good. I've seen that on a lot of Huskies for some reason. It just goes right through the crankcase too. Okay, so get rid of this dumb sticker. Jesus. I don't want to take my glove off. There. So. I always color in this sight line. This is something I do. I use a paint marker. You don't want to use Sharpie or anything like that. Uh, Sharpie, it'll like bleed and turn like this weird purple color. But if you're careful with this paint marker, Cause like the Sharpie too, if you, if you screw up it, you can get the, like the bulk of it off. It's really weird, but it leaves like a purple stain in the plastics that you can't get off. This stuff, if you get it on the white part, it, you can just kind of wipe it off. I don't know. It's really weird. Sharpie is a, something weird about that stuff, but I've done it before where even on customer saws, I felt bad but uh, it wasn't that nice with saw but I sharpied it in and then I think it was out in the rain or something and it bled and it turned the side cover like this light purple it looked horrible guy still my customer though he forgave me but uh yeah there we go so I, I color that in put the west coast dogs on it and the chain catch the roller catch and we are good to do the, the heat cycle. So let's talk about heat cycles. I do heat cycles. I believe in them. I think they're a, 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 almost a must, honestly, especially for ported saws. I know they've been ran in the factory and all that, but after doing this work and for break-in, heat cycles are very important. I don't get them too ridiculously hot, but I don't baby them. So, on the third heat cycle, uh, I'll hold that thing, you know, wide open for a little bit with the bar and chain on. But you gotta, you gotta feed a little speed to your ride. And two strokes do not like to be babied. You, uh, you treat a two stroke like a, like a wild animal. Where's the, oh, there it is. Too 
tool. Because I've seen, I've heard all kinds of crazy different ways to break in, like go half throttle or the, the craziest was to idle for an entire tank of fuel. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that. I do not agree with that. Uh, I've, I've actually seen the inside of a couple of these saws that they were told to, from the steel dealership, they were told to idle for a full tank of fuel. And, oh my God, the inside of that saw is just so gummed up, it's insane. And plus, they don't, they don't move, they don't move air very well with the, you know, because the, the flywheel, the speed of the, the engine moves air through the flywheel when they're idling. They just sit there, they cook. And it's what it smelled like. It smelled like hot, burnt oil. I'll probably take these off when I ship it, but just for demonstration purposes at all. Oh, what the hell did I do that for? John, you dumbass. And these, guy wants to leave them a little loose, probably those two especially. And then when you put your roller chain catch in, it'll line up. The West Coast dogs give you a little more room. So they're kind of nice like that. Uh, some of the stock ones are a pain in the ass. And yes, I just grab this damn thing and take this off. As long as you hold it like you got a set, it'll be fine. I'd like to see the guy that who you, you take the clip off and do it. Yeah, right. Who the hell does that? Also, I put it on. This is just one of my things. I put it on the felling dog that's on the saw. I don't know if people like that. They don't like it. I've always done it like this, and nobody's really complained about it. But to me, personally, I like having the cover, you know, free of, you know, that extra, you know, like this. Just have it like that, and it's, it seems to me that it's easier to do it this way. But a lot of them come with the, with the roller catch on the side cover, fell and dug. I don't know why. I think that's just maybe how they set them up, but I don't like it like that. So again, we'll leave this loose a little bit. The West Coast dogs are nice. They go right on. It gives you a little bit of room in there. They're basically laser cut or whatever. It's lined up perfectly. So then with no pressure on it, I tighten these up. Let them hang off the workbench so there's no there's nothing pushing on it. Like that. There we go. Then if you're if you don't have any weight on it or nothing, you know when you tighten everything up that that thing's gonna be perfectly lined up in the middle. Okay. Look at that. Too easy. All right. We'll wipe it off a little bit, but let's get some fuel in this bad boy and see if she's ready to rock. I use VP 40 to 1 premix only. That's all I ever use. This is some really, really good fuel. And since I'm always doing break in and uh, heat cycles. I like the 40 to one, but if you're running it nonstop, you know, like, or permanently, a guy could go 50 to one. I'm just one of those guys that I, 40 to one doesn't hurt anything. So why not? 
And I do put oil, bar oil in them. I'm not sure if it does hurt the pump or not. I've, I kind of have heard different theories on that, but I figure if it could possibly hurt the pump, I should probably put some bar oil in it instead of running it dry. But if anybody does have the answer on that, so I don't have all the answers, that's for damn sure. But if somebody knows that definitively, let me know. Because I sure as hell would like to not do it for shipping and everything. It's kind of a pain in the ass. I don't like, I'd like to leave it dry if I could, especially like this one. The 461s that I get are kind of a, they're for the wildfire crews, so it's kind of, they're on contract and they're not started. And that's, I like that. They've never had bar oil. They don't leak. So the decon, I don't even really like sending this back, but I will send it back. Felling dogs, probably wants them. So just it's real simple, just throw everything in here. I'll box that up nice in a little bit. All right, let's change the camera angle and I'll go fire this bad boy up. Actually, I won't, I don't know, someone will claim that I put fuel in it or something. Okay, let's fire it up. So. I actually did have it running already. I did the first heat cycle. The camera wasn't recording. I don't know what the hell's going on. cycles the next one I, I throw a bar on it bar and chain and then I I would it Ooh, look at that thing sitting up there all nice it's like a brand new saw but way better hell yeah so yeah that's it guys I mean that pretty much wraps it up if you're still with me holy shit you ain't got nothing better to do damn no I'm just kidding I really appreciate it you guys uh, but this is my favorite part of the build this is where it's all worth it and it just uh, melts my heart a little bit uh, getting paid so Send that money, my man. I appreciate that. That just uh, gets me down deep. Uh, yeah, send that money. But uh, yeah, no, this is about it. Uh, I'll box it up. I'll send it off. I'll get to the next one. This is another one going to the Hotshot Crews. Uh, this one's going to, uh, I can't remember which one, but it's going to one of the Shot Crews. Uh, the next three are. Uh, all the 461s go to the Shot Crews uh, or like Sierra Nevada Timber is another one. And it's a couple of these these wildfire crews. Um, that's, that's why I have so many 461 sitting around. It's kind of a long story, but I get them on the, on the agreement that they are going back to, uh, the, the Cali, you know, wildfire crews. So 
that's an awesome gig. I absolutely love it, but no, I cannot sell you a 461. Uh, if you, if you're, if you're able to get one, your, your chief will get a hold of me or, or someone on your crew will get a hold of me. So enough about that. Uh, it just really is. I know I, I brag about it all the time, but that is, that means a lot to me that these guys are running my saws. They like them and they want more. That's badass. I love it. Uh, friends and family and fire and rescue and it's a tough gig and they help people. So sweet. Other than that, yeah, this, uh, I know this video was really long, but I want to get over that hump of the uh, 4,000 watch hours. I know I keep banging on that, but the plan with the YouTube channel is to make money. Uh, I've always, you know, I'm a straight shooter. I never beat around the bush. I'll tell you how it is. This, this is what it's for. And if I could pull that off, I can do just the, the wildfire and production saws and existing customers and then focus on some of the real crazy stuff that I got. Like uh, I got two 084s coming, a CD 2100. Those are all those three saws were just uh, you know bought and agreed upon, bartered, traded, whatever the hell I had to do to get to them uh, within the last week. And I also have a bike saw in the works and the 460, the nitrous saw is getting a makeover because that thing is starving for fuel after the expansion chamber. So I'm putting a, a Tilly in it, a tilt sink carb. And out of a, a 100 plus cc steel cutoff saw yeah, a real old one so that should be pretty cool but that's the plan with it i'd love to be able to do really crazy builds like that you know and i'm talking you ain't seen shit yet honestly like really really crazy stuff and that's what i got into in the first place and that's that's you know john's custom saws that's it's custom uh, i do a lot of stuff that other other guys don't do you know, it's, there's places that you can get powder coating. There's places that you can get hydro dipping. There's places that you can get porting, but there's not really places that you can do it all and throw nitrous on it and have it work. So that's what I pride myself in is pulling stuff off, putting, you know, carb swaps and crank swaps, all that stuff. That's the stuff I really love. So, um, a lot more of that to come and I really appreciate the support you guys. All right. Till next time. Make some sawdust.